Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here and share some of my thoughts about MSP and the offshore wind uh, development. Before I get started, I maybe just uh, add some words to, words to uh, the presentation introduction of me. Uh, in this context, I'm working very closely together with NIA, a Danish consultant who has uh, time-wise more experience than I have on, on, on uh, offshore wind actually uh, Neuros has been the one to design the foundation for the very first offshore park in the world, Winneby, which is now about to be decommissioned. Uh, besides that, Neuros has been very deep involved, not less in the British and, and, and uh, Danish planning of offshore wind, uh, mainly to advise uh, authorities in planning and consenting. Uh, and finally, Neuros is also pretty much involved in MSP in, uh, in uh, the British uh, set up in general, but also in the uh, GG Mayor project on that. Um, the question here is basically what can MSP do for continuous cost reduction for offshoring? The reason for using the cost reduction is, is so to say, the, the key phrase here is basically that reduction of uh, cost of electricity for offshore wind is definitely the license to operate for offshore wind. We have, um, we have had a long period where the prices for offshore wind was increasing, the cost was increasing, which means that uh, the demand uh, for subsidies was increasing, increasing, increasing. I'll come back to that. Um, when I asked the question whether MSP is an obstacle or it's, it's a tool, it could be addressed in, in the sense that um, uh, one of the keynote speakers this morning talked about MSP is a toolbox, but it's also you all around um, uh, this conference here. Um, and the dilemma is probably that you are all experts in your area, and you think your area is the most important. If not, you have the wrong job, simply. So the challenge here is, if you say, what I'm doing is the most important, and it should be uh, dominant uh, towards everything else. We are talking about probably you're creating an obstacle. If you are open-minded here, and what, in my mind, uh, MSP basically is all about, is to realize that we can't do anything on this globe without adverse impact, which also means that we need to find a way to balance impact advantages of whatever we're doing we can't do anything offshore, whether it's offshore wind or navigation, without adverse impact on something. We need some way to, to, to balance it out. If I look outside, on, on, uh, I took a brief uh, uh, tour around this presentation outside the posters. Uh, are we counting up or down? Oh, God, I counting down. Um, I think you have all what is needed to identify obstacles, interests. The challenge is now to find a way to balance that out, to find solutions. Everybody has to give something off to find solutions, because you can't do anything without having adverse impact on something. Now talking about um, cost of electricity and the MSP. One thing I think is straightforward. The first is the planning process to be able to de-risk the projects for the developer and the operator by having, could you say, an, 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 uh, clear and transparent uh, set up and, and, and uh, uh, constant process, constant produ uh, procedure and all that to make it predictable and transparent for any developer. Uh, when you go to that, uh, of course, create a reduction of risk of delays on proper design or operation conditions. I think it's relatively straightforward. I would not address more to that. But moreover, it's also a matter about find the right sites for offshore wind. I'll come back to, to, to this, but it is, for several reasons, very, very important. And for that reason, I'll actually take the first slide here is what I mentioned, the cost, cost of electricity. Around 20... 13, that's, that's a commission date, so, so um, the price that was set in 2013 was an auction around 10, uh, 2010, where the most expensive, uh, one of the most expensive projects today seen from the society was one of the Danish uh, projects, Anhold. It was a point in time where there were 
more or less no suppliers. There were monopoly and turbines and, uh, and a lot of uncertainty in the industry. And at that point in time, it was decided, uh, so to say, simultaneously in Denmark and UK, we need to reduce cost of electricity down to what the British started to say, a uh, hundred dollar, no, hundred pound per megawatt hour. Don't compare with those figures because they are it's uh, it's a different scope. And um, very shortly after, the, the Danish the Danish developers decided to give it a little bit more than hundred euros per megawatt hour for a project that should be decided in 2020. And they did not do that for fun, they did it because they need to do it, otherwise this industry would die, simply. Um, so what happened? Well, I need to take some history. I don't have much time. I was instructed not to make a slideshow out of that, so you just look at this picture when I, uh, while I'm talking. I need to take a little bit of the history. Uh, I'm one of the dinosaurs in this off offshore wind business, and, and I have to, um, to look a little bit back in history to, um, to the 1997, where we in Denmark made How Wind Mølle Handlings Plan, the offshore wind turbine action plan. Um, uh, quite easy to pronounce. Um, and that was basically the first attempt to make MSP. We didn't use the phrase MSP. There was a lot of the toolbox that you, tool you have now we didn't use. But we actually went out to the sea and said, well, we wanted to deploy offshore wind here. Uh, how do we do that? Then we started the mapping uh, process. Uh, all authorities, all stakeholders, more or less with, with some few exemptions, looked at the Danish water. And we went that far out then to the 10 meter depth, because that was the limit for the technology at that point in time, 10 meters of water map that and say, well, where, have, where are all these interests? Where are they? And they were mapped. They were quite of quantified, if you could do that. And then there was a process where everybody around the table discussed openly, can you get around it? Can you mitigate? Can you coexist? And that was, that was the first attempt. And, and I mean, the outcome of that was a, was a Danish plan, demonstration plan, uh, outlining five times 150 megawatt projects on Danish water, where everybody agreed we can manage all potential conflict of interest. Some of them need to be supported by, by monitoring, uh, because we took the worst, worst case approach to that. Uh, but we did it later on, it became, it was reduced to two times uh, 150 megawatt. It is the Nystad one and Horse River one, which was the first full scale offshore project. Followed up with a very extensive monitoring program, trying to also to where we are, uh, to to, uh, to monitoring on the areas where we were had the impression no, there is no impact, no adverse impact. But we better check it, uh, and we did that. That has happened several times uh, during the last uh, 15 years. Again, each and every time new things came up. Um, you could say the same was more or less done. We saw that for the Netherlands, which developed one school of offshore wind planning in, in Northern Europe. Another school was a school in Germany and UK, where it more or less, uh, I wouldn't say Wild West, but at least in the beginning in Germany, it was some, whoever who could claim a piece of water could start planning for offshore wind. It gave two complete different ways of developing offshore wind but now there is a tendency they would merge again by having the German and the British approaching a little bit more on, on, on the way that's been done in, in Denmark, Denmark and, and Netherlands. Now, recently we, have, we saw on this previous slide that uh, we are pretty much low now in, in price. The latest one was Kreyes Park, but we saw more or less the same in, uh, uh, recently in the Netherlands. Very, very low prices. How come? There are millions of explanations why. Some of them are low uh, interest rate, low oil price, low, low steel prices, but it's also a matter about maturation of the technology. A lot of good reason. But one of the most important in my mind here was they are the right sites. They are definitely the right sites. And, and you should not expect many more, much more of that. Some few in Netherlands, maybe some few in Denmark. You will never, I don't think you will see prices like that again, simply because they were the right size. Now, coming to what we are now talking about, the Baltic. 
There is not that much happen, happening right now in offshore wind in the Baltic. We have seen a lot of things happening in the North Sea. Recently, we saw the countries around the North Sea on government level and industry level agree on taking a common approach to offshore wind in the North Sea, main, meaning mainly to set up general uh, and same rules on how we develop, how we act out here. Um, there was a mapping of uh, North Sea offshore wind capacity saying roughly 100 gigawatt of capacity uh, available out there, of which the 30 is in Danish, in Danish ground or Danish waters, and, and uh, probably not the, the worst of them. Um, so take the next step and say, I shouldn't care about whether it's in Denmark or Germany, I should take the best side. It's a political and, and, and regulatory uh, challenge, but what I would like you in, uh, in, in, in this forum talking about the Baltic was actually to follow what one of the opening speakers uh, uh, said this morning. Maybe not, just, I'll rephrase a little bit. You should not talk about trans-border assessment, trans-border planning. You should consider the Baltic Sea as one and try to make an assessment of that. You should make an assessment. Time is running. I think I will flip to one of my, my few slides here. Could you, could you imagine that instead of thinking about making planning for offshore wind in Denmark, and somebody's making for offshore wind in Sweden, and somebody in Finland, and somebody in Latvia, etc., on individual waters, could you imagine that you took a whole view and say, where are the best sites in the Baltic for make the most efficient offshore wind? I know there's a lot of, of uh, political and regulatory challenges here, but try to ignore that. If you look at the cost reduction, one very important param parameter here is it means that the subsidy, the demand for subsidy, the urgent need for subsidy to make this happen is rapidly decreasing, which means probably the thinking about we're doing this in our own world because we need it on our own carbon account and we need to, to utilize basically our own subsidy. When you reduce the subsidy, uh, it's probably more easy to see on a more global or regional that you see it here. So, so, so that's basically what, what I would like you to think about. Could you forget it all about the national stuff and talking about the Baltic? I have two maps here, you know, talking about offshore when I see time is out. There are three things when you make an assessment of, of, of a wind park. The first assessment is, is the wind, because I mean wind is a fuel, and you should think about the wind speed and energy is not a linear. Uh, so 10 percent increase in wind speed means up to 15 percent of production. So it's important that the wind blows. The next thing is ground, water depth. And water depth does not mean the distance from the surface to the, to the seabed but the distance from the surface to some ground that you can build a foundation on down there. And um, it's not always uh, as you see the same areas here. The third one is, of course, can you get access to the grid? You need to deliver your products or your products somewhere out there. I mean, without a grid connection, it doesn't really work for, for us in offshore wind. Um, I do not have a slide on that because I think there is a lot of planning on, on, on building out uh, interconnectors and high voltage system here, but it's a part of, of this equation here. But these two pictures, you have, I think you have a lot of tools to put them together and say, where does the wind blow? Where do we have the ground? And then you should start with that saying, all the other things that you have in your mind for MSP, they should put in this equation and say, how do we get the best out of that to create an industry here that at the same time gives a lot of jobs, gives a probably the cheapest low carbon electricity than you can imagine uh, if you compare not to what you have out there today, but what you have to build tomorrow to do that and start that. I don't know whether it's possible, but I will uh, sincerely hope that it is possible to take this view instead of taking the small bits and pieces. Thank you very much.